So today's symposium is called Metastasis in Immunity, How Immune Cells Can Help Cancer Spread or Stop It in Its Tracks. And before we get to the uh, program, I just wanted to mention that this is a public lecture that's been going on for 15 years now. And it's a partnership with Cold Spring Harbor and St. John Le Nursing Center with support from Northwell Health. And I want to thank um, to the, uh, the team at the Cold Spring Harbor Public Affairs that puts this symposium together, particularly Jessica Giordano, who is here. Thank you, Jess. And also to St. John Lens, particularly Kathy Wardell, who's somewhere. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, and also to our great AV team that helps put this on in this great auditorium, and our uh, Cold Spring Harbor facilities crew that help make these events go so smoothly. Uh, so tonight we have two fantastic women scientists as speakers. Um, the first will be Mikola Egeblad. So she's an associate professor at Cold Spring Harbor since 2009. And her research, which you'll hear about today, has been recognized by several awards, including the Pershing Square Sohn Prize and the Air of Hope Scholar Award from the Department of Defense. And joining her will be Sylvia Adams, who's an associate professor at NYU. And she's the director of clinical research at Breast Cancer Disease Management Group. She's a medical oncologist specializing in caring for patients with breast cancer, and she also conducts research, including clinical trials involving treatment of breast cancer. Mikola and Sylvia are actually collaborators. They work together on a project, um, which is very exciting. Um, we'll hear a little bit more about that tonight. And so the format tonight will be, Mikola will start with around a 20 minute talk or so, and there you'll have opportunity to ask her some questions right after her talk. And then we'll move to Sylvia. She'll give another her talk, and you'll have opportunity to ask Sylvia questions. And then we're going to end with bringing both of them up here into these nice chairs, and they will answer your questions. And after that, there will be a reception. So that's the uh, format for the program, and we'll start now with Mikola. So I'm going to talk about uh, immune cells that help cancer spread, and a particularly one type of immune cells called neutrophils. And what you're seeing here on this very first slide is uh, actually strings of DNA in blue. And DNA doesn't normally look like that in a cell. And I'll tell you what it's doing, why it's making these strings, and how that's helping the cancer spread. So the first thing to know about tumors is really that tumors are much more than just the cancer cells. And you can see this on a uh, biopsy of a uh, breast tumor. So one of the first things that happens when you uh, suspect that you have cancer is a biopsy is being taken, and a pathologist is looking at that in the microscope. And what they see is uh, here in blue cancer cells. But if you stain for it, you'll also notice that there are all these immune cells, which here have been stained in brown, so you can recognize them. So you can see that maybe half of the tumor is not even tumor cells. And what we're doing in, uh, in my laboratory is trying to understand what are these immune cells doing to the cancer cells. Now, in this picture, it's all static. It's a dead tissue. It's been taken out. It's been formally infixed. It's been cut to slices. And so we can't really understand how these cells are talking to each other from looking in a microscope this way. So to try to understand how are they talking in real time, how are they doing it in live action, we uh, took advantage of some basic discovery research. So it had been discovered that a jellyfish has a fluorescent protein. It's called green fluorescent protein. And that fluorescent protein by um, Martin Shelfi was taken into living organisms. And he was then able to make a mouse like this turn in green. And then Roger Cheen was able to modify this version of the uh, green fluorescent protein from the jellyfish so we could have not just green mice, but also red or blue mice. And now what we are doing is we are taking all these colors and putting them in different cells, some in the cancer cells, some in different immune cells. And now we can look at it. We can see how they're talking. So we built a special microscope. And we have now on the microscope a living mouse that's here, anesthetized. It's breathing the anesthesia gas, which is the same kind of gas that you would get if you were uh, under surgery. And then in the uh, a monitor from the microscope, you can now watch the tumor. And this is what it looks like. You can see the immune cells here in a blood vessel. And they are crawling around. And some of them are coming out of the blood vessel and getting into the tumor. And we can now start to understand what are these cells doing to the cancer cells. 
So the first thing we were interested in trying to, to learn was what happens when you give a, a mouse or a patient chemotherapy. This is one of the most classical types of treatment that are given to patients. So what actually happens if we look on the microscope while we're giving the treatment? And to do this, uh, we were watching the mice for a very long time. Um, this is a movie that's been going on for 29 hours after we gave the chemo. And you can start to see here in red that a lot of the cancer cells have been killed. So we did a trick that they switch color from blue to red when they are dying. But uh, I remember taking that movie. That was one of the last movies that I took before I got my own lab. And I had been uh, in the room for 29 hours, as you can imagine. I was dozing off, <laughs> to be honest. And then I saw this happening. And you can see in green these immune cells, a type of immune cells called inflammatory cells, coming into the tumor. So it's almost like an ant swarm. They're coming in in very high numbers. And this was 4 a.m. in the morning, and I remember thinking, this is very strange. I wonder what it means. So these kind of uh, inflammatory immune cells that we were looking at are the type of immune cells that are helping us killing bacteria. So here is a movie where we, instead of using cancer cells, have used red bacteria. And what you can see on this movie is how the immune cells, inflammatory cells, are coming through the blood vessel, and they are finding that something's wrong here, and they're lining the, the wall of the blood vessel, and they're coming out, and they're finding the bacteria. They know where to go. And once they find them, as you can see here in higher magnification, the individual bacteria, this type of inflammatory cell doesn't do anything. But now another one comes in, this is a neutrophil, and it starts engulfing and eating these bacteria. So these are really very important immune cells for us in terms of um, combating an infection. <coughs> but inflammatory cells also do other things than just killing bacteria. They are very critical for what's known as wound healing. In the wound healing process, the first thing that happens is, again, uh, that uh, the inflammatory cells come in and they kill the bacteria. But then they start the process of repairing the wound. They secrete signals that make the neighboring cells start to proliferate, to divide. So there are more cells to replace the ones that were dead. And they make signals to make the blood vessel uh, regenerate so that the tissue, again, can have oxygen. And then finally, they start the process where the cells can move together and close the wound so we don't have these gapping open wounds. So you can imagine that these kind of inflammatory cells in a tumor, that could actually be hijacked to promote the tumor growth. These signals to make cells spread, uh, to proliferate, or make new blood vessels come in would make the tumor do the same. And the signals that can make cells move may be able to make the cancer cell spread. And indeed, that's what happens. So what we found was that these inflammatory cells that are coming into the tumor turns out to be the bad ones. They're not killing the cancer cells. They're promoting it and making it harder for the cancer to be killed by chemo. What you're seeing here is um, the, the tumor in a normal mouse. And we give it chemo. And you can see it's not actually shrinking. It's slowed down a little bit. And then after just a few weeks, it continues to grow. These tumors become resistant to the therapy very rapidly. It doesn't work very well. But here, we have taken away the inflammatory cells through a genetic trick. And so now they are no longer coming in. And you can see that the tumor remains the same size for a longer time. So this is uh, an approach that's now taken to clinical trials. And people, uh, we are trying to understand whether this could actually help patients have a longer response to their chemotherapeutic treatment. Now, <clears throat> what I've shown you so far is work we've done in the, first, in the primary tumor, in the breast tumor in this case, and how we can watch the cancer cells uh, go into the tissue and interact with the immune cells. But one of the biggest problems in most types of cancer is not the primary tumor. In many cases, we can uh, cut that out. We can irradiate it. But what we're all worried about is when the cancer spread. And for breast cancer patients, it's about 2 out of 10 that that uh, eventually happens. So we wanted to understand how did the cells get there? How did they get into the new tissue, for instance, along? And when they do, what is their interaction with the immune cells in that new tissue? So to do that, <clears throat> we wanted to, again, do, do imaging. But to do imaging in a, uh, in a lung is quite difficult. As you can imagine, 
the, um, the lung is moving, it's breathing the mouse, you would hope so if it's live imaging. So with a collaborator at UCSF in San Francisco, uh, we designed these windows. So these are 3D printed plastic windows and they are put in, uh, in between the ribs of the mouse and you put the mouse on a ventilator. Uh, so this is quite involved surgery as you can imagine. And through this little glass hole, we can now do microscopy in a living mouse in the lung and see what happens when the cancer cells arrive to the lung. So this is what you're seeing here in red. We have some of the cancer cells that had arrived to the lung. And then we have the inflammatory cells in green. And now we wanted to see all the other cells in the tissue. So we injected a dye in blue that would make the DNA of all the cells turn blue so we could see them. But this is what we saw. We see that we have cells here. All these dots is an individual cell that's staining blue the way you would expect. But around this one cell, we are seeing not a dot, but a smear or a cloud of DNA signal. So it was very mysterious in the beginning what was going on here. What is this cloud of DNA? And so to try to understand that, we used a different technique, electron microscopy. So this is the image that you have seen on the uh, the surface of the, uh, on the front page of the uh, program for tonight. This is a normal neutrophil in an electron microscope. And this is a neutrophil that has taken its DNA and made these hair strings or spiderweb kind of structures that's coming out of the neutrophil. And you can really see how it looks very different. This is the structure that we are staining in the living microscope and we can follow. So what are these peculiar structures? Well, this is, you saw before how the neutrophil could eat bacteria, but some of the pathogens that we are encountering are too big to be eaten. This is a uh, aspergillus yeast, and you can see it's much longer than any neutrophil. So here they are clumping around the aspergillus, trying to eat it, and they can't. So what they do instead is they take their DNA, and you'll see in a moment the DNA light up in uh, bright orange as it comes out of the cell. And they take the DNA and they use the DNA as a spider web where they put in the same toxic enzymes that's normally eating the bacteria inside, but now they are on the outside and they can attack this yeast on the outside. So what we found was happening in the tumors was that the tumor cells are hijacking this mechanism. They come to the vasculature, to the blood vessels in the lung, and then they send a signal to attract the neutrophils these particular inflammatory cells. And then they give them a second signal, a signal that tricks these cells to think that there's a bacteria or yeast so that they form these extracellular traps, neutrophil extracellular traps, and they have in them the enzymes. And these uh, enzymes, these proteins, make small holes that makes it possible for the cancer cells to get into the tissue and start to sit there. But they do more than that. We also found that they stimulate the cancer cells to start divide and make more and grow faster. So it, this was of course discovered not in cancer originally, but in inflammatory diseases. People were trying to understand how are neutrophils combining a different bacteria, different yeast. Um, and one disease that has problem with uh, many, many infections is cystic fibrosis. And these patients tend to have infections that they can't get rid of, and the uh, bacteria and the yeast trigger all of these nets to form in the lung. So there is a drug that the patients can inhale to dissolve the nets in their lung so they can breathe better. And so we wanted, can we use that same kind of drug to prevent metastasis in our mouse models? And we tested it, and it didn't work. The drug is called DNAs. So we were thinking for a long time, what can we do to make this better? What is the problem? Why is it not working? And it turned out that the problem is that the DNA is only active for 30 minutes after you inject it. So you inject it into the patients, it's active, and then it stops working. You can't inject a drug every 30 minutes. That's just not possible. So what can we do about this? And I remember giving a talk about this uh, at Dana-Farber Institute, and after my talk, one scientist came up to me and said, I think I have a way to solve your problem. We have made something called nanoparticles. And when we put things on nanoparticles, they stay active for a longer time. 
would you like to collaborate? So I said yes. <laughs> and he made nanoparticles that were coated with this uh, drug DNAs. So these are the naked nanoparticles that are given to the mice. And you can see these mice have metastasis. All of these arrows are pointing to regions in the lung wherever you have metastasis. There's lots of metastasis in these mice. This is an example from a mouse that had the nanoparticles that he designed. And you can see that the lungs looks almost normal. This worked really well in our mice. Now, the next thing, though, is that for many of the breast cancer patients, it's hard to know when they're going to get the metastasis. When uh, patients are diagnosed, most of the breast cancer patients do not have metastatic disease, at least not that we can recognize clinically. But we know that many of them will have cancer cells that have already <coughs> spread somewhere else in the tissue. So they may sit in the bones, in the brain, uh, in the lung, or in the liver. What we don't know is who's going to recur, when and where. It's about, again, as I said, two out of 10 that have this recurrence. So where, when, and why is a big question. So to start to try to understand that, we developed a new way, a new mouse model to look at what's known as dormant breast cancer. This is such a model, and you can see a cancer cell here sitting again in the lung, and there is, again, these inflammatory neutrophils sitting around it. We also have the, the DNA dye, but now we're not seeing a cloud. This may be the most boring movie we have ever acquired. Nothing is happening. The cancer cell is sitting there, and the neutrophils seem to come and sort of look at it and then go away. So you can see how they are swarming around it, but then they go away. They don't do anything, and the cancer cell doesn't do anything. Nothing happens. This is a sleeping cancer cell. But as we were one, looking at this movie, we were wondering, why is this cancer cell sleeping, whereas the other ones were metastatic? What would happen if now there was an infection and these neutrophils were forming, again, neutrophil extracellular traps, but it was not the cancer cells that were inducing it, but it, it was the bacteria. So, um, so that's the question. What happens if there's an infection in a mice that have one of these sleeping uh, cancer cells? So to test that, we took now something called endotoxin, which is a component of the bacterial wall. And it, it's one of the drivers of what's known as sepsis. It's quite dangerous. Um, but you can give it to mice to mimic a lung infection. And so that's what we've done here. This is a mouse that just got saline as a control. And this is a mouse that got endotoxin. And now we're just imaging what happens to these neutrophils. Over here, you can see nothing much happens. You have these black spots. That is a nice airways. Uh, you have uh, the the uh, DNA in the nucleus, and you have the, the neutrophils moving around to see if anything's going on and nothing's going on. But over here, after endotoxin inhalation, you can see now there's more neutrophils. They look much more flat. And you can see there's also a stronger DNA signal. They're starting to make nets. And we have in red a special trick where we can see where is an active net. So whenever there's an active net, it turns, the area turns red. We have the same trick over here, but there's no net, so you don't see a signal, it's all black. Now, so what happens when we activate these nets? Well, these are our control mice. They have the cancer cells sitting. A few hundred cells are sitting in the lungs and doing nothing. This is eight months out where we've looked at them, and you can't see anything. These are the mice that got endotoxin. Three weeks after they had this uh, experimental infection, all of the mice had metastatic disease in the lungs. Many of them also had it in the bone. This is what the lungs look like. It's all over. And these mice are dying within three to four weeks. And these are the mice that we treated with the nano DNAs particle that we generated. You can see now three out of, of five mice, and that turns out also in bigger numbers. About 60% of these mice, they do not get any metastatic disease. But they still have the cancer cells sitting there sleeping. And those that do get it, it's growing much slower. So we're very excited about these results. Um, we're thinking about how can, we, um, how can we apply that to the clinical situation. So some of you may think, well, what's, is this only in breast cancer cells? And uh, we've already tested it in prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer models in mice. 
And there it's the same thing. If we have sleeping cancer cells in the lung from prostate or pancreatic cancer, they do not, uh, they are activated by these nets and we can inhibit it by targeting the nets. But it's in mice, so what about people? And that is the main thing we are trying to understand right now. Do these nets awaken the dormant, the sleeping cancer cells in, in people? We don't know, but we know already that in people, you can have nets after infections, after trauma, after smoking, and after obesity. So all of these situations are associated with higher levels of nets in the blood. And so what we are trying to do now is to find out if we detect the nets, does this person have a higher risk of having the cancer coming back? And so that brings me to, to the end, really starting to think about which patients might benefit from this net targeted therapy. And I wanna mention two people that are a major inspiration to me. This is our beloved Miss Debbie from uh, the Cold Spring Harbor Daycare Center. She's brought up most of the kids here from the lab and she passed away last week from metastatic ovarian cancer. And we, um, we miss her dearly. And of course, we are speculating ovarian cancer that is so aggressive, do the nets play a role? And we don't know, but we're gonna start trying to find out. This is Dale Karp, that's my brother-in-law's mother. And she is one of the people I really have in mind when I'm thinking about where could this go? So she had head and neck cancer and she was treated successfully with surgery. So the primary tumor was removed. And then three years later, it came back and when it came back, there was no sign of metastatic disease. So she had surgery again, and then she was gonna get chemotherapy. But right after the surgery, the cancer spread dramatically metastatic all over the body, and the chemo only worked for a short time, and unfortunately, she passed away. So I've spoken with clinicians since, and they see that in patients. Some patients have a, a very dramatic uh, recurrence of metastatic disease right after a treatment. So what we are wondering is, did she have a lot of excess nets? Can we detect it? And would she be kind of the patient where we could prevent the metastatic disease by targeting the nets simultaneously with surgery? So with that, I wanna uh, finish by thanking the people that did the work. A lot of the work you've seen today is done by Jean Albrenkis, a postdoc in my lab, with the help <clears throat> of many people in my lab, including David, Mario, Li Zhuang, Emilis, and Laura. Uh, I also want to acknowledge all of my collaborators. So uh, at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, I had very many collaborators help us really develop this and test it in uh, many different models, including uh, Johannes Ye that's helped us uh, generate a way of targeting these nets, and, um, and Doc Fearn and Lloyd Trotman that helped us test it in prostate and pancreatic cancer. Outside of, of uh, Cold Spring Harbor, we have many collaborators helping us to move this forward. Uh, Max Krimmel, as I mentioned, is the one that's really helping us being able to image in the lung. It is really as hot as you might think. And uh, then we are studying um, these nets in humans uh, and in different types of inflammatory diseases with Ken Pinkerton and Scott and Jill hamilton Rees. Uh, Michael Goldberg is the collaborator at Dana-Farber that generated these nanoparticles and Sylvia Adams, you're gonna hear from in just a moment. And so with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. We'll be doing some very short Q&A right after Mikola's talk here, and then Dr. Adams will speak, and we'll have a short Q&A then, and then a Q&A all together. So this will be short, but we'll have time for a couple questions. Uh, do benign tumors ever convert to cancerous tumors, and vice versa? And what is the similarity between a tumor that's non-malignant and a malignant tumor? Is there a similarity? Oh, that, <clears throat> that's a very fundamental question. So uh, yes, benign tumors sometimes do convert um, they, if they acquire additional mutations. Um, it is rare to see the opposite, but it, it may happen. It has been shown to, to occur in mouse models, but it's much harder to prove in, in a patient. The, the difference, the definition is really whether or not the cancer cells is starting to, to spread. You can see whether it's trying to leave the tissue and once it's trying to leave the tissue, uh, whether or not it's done it successfully, we consider it malignant. Um, 
what is the difference between net therapy, immune therapy, and targeted therapy, the drugs? Can you explain the difference? So the targeted therapy is usually going after a specific target. So that would be uh, often a genetic mutation in the cancer cells. So people have discovered um, mutations and they have found drugs that are specifically directed against these mutations. For um, the NETs, it's specifically going off through this, this DNA scaffold and trying to dissolve it or target the enzymes that are on it so that the NETs can't be functioning. And immunotherapy is, is functioning by stimulating the good part of the immune cells. So instead of having these bad immune cells that are uh, making the tumor worse, you are stimulating the good immune cells that you're going to hear about in a moment to make sure that they work better. One right here. Hi. Um, is it possible for chemo to trigger the growth of a dormant cancer cell? So there is some, some data suggesting that chemo can have uh, disadvantages for uh, uncertain situations, and some of the chemo also works on the immune cells. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing comes back to this question, is it a good or a bad immune cell we are targeting? Uh, I think, although chemo is one of our oldest types of drugs, we don't fully understand how it works um, beyond just the cancer cells. How does it work on the ag uh, organismal level in, in the whole body view? And uh, that's one of the things we certainly are trying to, to understand better. Hi. Is there a risk for DNAs to attack regular DNA in other cells besides neutrophils? So we all make DNAs already. Uh, it's, uh, we have our own DNAs uh, that is targeting some of these floating uh, nets even. And, and it's, uh, when we look at the, the, um, the presence of nets that are spontaneously forming, they're not very long lived because of our own DNAs. Um, with the nanoparticles, we are hoping that it doesn't get into the cell, but, but you're right, there is always safety concerns, and, and the best way to do that is, is to, uh, to do the more animal experiment, more carefully targeting the safety of that, and just finding out the safety of that, and then ultimately um, dose escalating in, in patients. All right, we'll move on to Dr. Adams. Thank you, Nicola. Okay, great. Thank you. I always like hearing, um, Mikla always tells a great story with great movies. Um, and so Mikla's research is a good example of the type of, of the power of uh, how basic research can inform uh, clinical research. And now we're going to hear a story from Sylvia Adams about her research uh, and doing clinical trials in breast cancer. So Dr. Adams. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So it, it's a pleasure being here, and um, I'm very excited to collaborate uh, with Michala on understanding really the interaction of the host immune system of the patient with cancer and how one could potentially uh, harness this interaction to treat cancers and prevent them. So the topics that I would like to cover uh, initially, I would like to give you an overview of the tumor microenvironment um, and, and show you the different players uh, on the field that can be promoting cancer growth or actually inhibiting cancer growth. And then I will uh, focus on two cell types. One is macrophages that actually can also, similar to the neutrophils that we just heard about, enable invasion into blood vessels and metastases. And uh, they play an important role uh, that we have identified already in breast cancer as a prognostic biomarker. And from our last weekend's uh, large clinical oncology meeting in Chicago that you probably heard about, um, there, will be, uh, there was an, a plenary session on the Taylor X clinical trial, which I will briefly mention to you, because macrophages are actually part of that assay and how it affects our knowledge about cancer prognosis, but also how it guides us in terms of what therapies to use for the patient. And the second focus will be on lymphocytes. These are uh, our killer cells that can actually effectively kill cancer cells, uh, and how they are important for prognosis for patients, and also how we can um, harness them and make them stronger in our uh, treatment uh, programs. So 
Mikhail actually already showed you the uh, slide looking at a cancer under the microscope. And um, until you know, several years ago, our pathologists, when they did look at the cancer, they just saw this is the, the very, um, uh, very comprehensive tumor microenvironment, but they mainly looked at the cancer cells in here. And they gave us on the pathology report uh, information about how those cells look, how they are differentiated, what receptors they express, um, and they really didn't talk about much about what is in the stroma. So the stroma is basically all the supporting um, substance. They only gave us at this time if there was any cell death, um, how deeply the tumor invaded, and if there is also invasion of cancers into the blood vessels. However, the significant part of the stroma is actually that it can help either cancer growth or it can help to stop cancer growth. And these are just a few of those components that we know to date. Uh, they are inflammatory cells, all these um, uh, floating um, cells in the circulation, um, some of which can either promote metastases, as we will talk about, and some of which can actually help fight the cancer. So, so there is a very uh, heterogeneous infiltrate in tumor cells that can be um, harnessed for, for our therapies. And this was just a very early uh, paper showing that if you look at that stromal infiltrate by gene expression analysis, and you look at good stromal cells, which we call here cluster set one, that patients who had this cluster uh, did very well. They lived um, without cancer recurrences, but patients who had in their tumors immune cells that were belonging to this inflammatory subtype that actually had significant progression, recurrence of disease, and had um, death. So this was one of the uh, initial papers to tell us that it's important to look at the stroma, not just at the cancer cells, because cancer cells would be similar in, in these patients. So let's talk about the macrophages. And um, this is a busy slide, but I guess if you can look at this um, uh, black window, you see three types of cells, very similar to what you saw in the prior talk. The cancer is growing here, and cancer cells are in red. The blood vessel is in blue, lined with endothelial cells. And macrophages, very similar to the neutrophils, are also in this complex. And we call this the TMEM complex. Um, and what happens is if you have a macrophage very close to the primary cancer, it can help invade cancer cells into the bloodstream and lead to metastases. And in a clinical study, this shows again survival of patients is affected by, by the likelihood of metastases. But most importantly, I want to bring your attention to the oncotypes. Oncotype DX assay, which is the one that was presented at ASCO last week, and that includes one gene that actually means macrophages. So these are all the genes in green that are uh, contained in this uh, panel. And this is basically after a woman undergoes surgery for breast cancer, we use the tissue not only to look at the differentiation grade, receptors, et cetera, but also to send this tissue for a special molecular test called the Oncotype DX21 gene assay. So 16 genes are cancer genes, and then there is five housekeeping genes um, or reference genes. And one of those uh, cancer genes is called CD for cluster of differentiation 68, and that is a macrophage marker. So the, the company that established this assay then put all these genes together and came up with a formula that culminates in a recurrent score. So when we get this um, score back, we show it to the patient and said, you have a recurrent score based on your tumorous molecular analysis of 17, which means that you have a X, Y, Z number of chance of recurrence in the next 10 years and can we use chemotherapy to bring that down or not? That is determined by the category of this. So the category, the, the subsets are low risk categories, intermediate and high risk patients. And when you're in the low risk category, that means your chance of recurrence is very small. 
and you just need hormone therapy if this is a hormone-positive tumor. In the high-risk group, you know that chemotherapy in addition to hormone therapy is important, but in the intermediate risk, we did not have an answer from a large clinical trial until basically one week ago. So in this trial, this was uh, uh, you know, a large plenary session uh, discussion, and this was also in the news afterwards, do women need chemotherapy? And we're very happy to say that this assay and the results in this intermediate group spare women from chemotherapy that we often give after surgery. So this is was Dr. Sporano's uh, presentation, and uh, it looked at a trial called TaylorX. So we wanted to tailor the therapy to the patient and her tumor based on the 21 gene assay. And um, this trial enrolled about 10,000 patients. I think we enrolled about 30 at NYU, and um, this was open at uh, hundreds of sites. And um, 10,000 women got enrolled. Patients who had a low risk, which is up to 10 in this um, trial, were just given hormone therapy for five years, typically. Women who had high risk recurrence scores were given chemotherapy and hormone therapy. But in this middle group, where we didn't know if chemotherapy can be helpful, we actually randomized patients. So that means they were randomly assigned 50-50 chance to chemotherapy, yes or no. Uh, in addition, everyone got endocrine or hormone therapy. So arm B is patients who only got hormone therapy, and an arm C is patients who received chemotherapy on top of hormone therapy. And you can see it's over 3,000 patients in each of the arms. And um, this was just more about characteristics of this patient population. So these are women who have hormone-positive breast cancers that are lymph node negative, so no axillary lymph nodes are involved and had relatively small tumors, one to two, three centimeters. Uh, the average age of women was 55, which is our typical population with early breast cancer. And um, a lot of women were perimenopausal at this age group, of course. So here's the data. This was probably one of the most exciting talks I've set in. Um, and you can see that the brown or bluish and yellow lines are really identical. So this means, uh, in the first graph here, that invasive disease-free survival, the chance that this cancer can return, either in the same breast, in the other breast, anywhere else in the body, is identical uh, between the two groups, meaning that chemotherapy is not needed. And the same holds true for distant relapse-free intervals, meaning that cancer returns outside of the breast area, such as in bone, as we've seen pictures before, or in the liver. That is, again, identical. And survival was also perfectly identical. So this is what we like to see uh, in terms of highest clinical evidence in a randomized trial. Um, this gives us level one evidence that we can actually now not recommend chemotherapy to the majority of our patients after breast surgery. Of course, there's always a caveat, and when you look at subset analysis of a negative trial, you find some uh, subgroups of women who may benefit from chemotherapy, and that unfortunate subgroup is uh, women under the age of 50, where depending on the recurrence score, there may be some benefit to chemotherapy. So that is continuing to be discussed on an individual basis with each woman in the clinic. So this was the interesting thought about macrophages, how they promote distant metastases, and if we actually, with chemotherapy, can bring the patient back and have um, higher cure rates. So this speaks to the, to the part of tumor promotion that you can see metastases here um, coming through the help of macrophages. And I hope I have neutrophils on here too, Mikala, forgive me if I don't. Um, so now let's talk about the second um, alternative is when CD8 cells or killer T cells, lymphocytes, can actually kill tumor cells and therefore um, inhibit the growth of cancers. This is our second um, topic. And similar to what uh, the prior speaker had discussed, sometimes you see more immune cells in a cancer than cancer cells. And this is a perfect example, and we call this example actually a lymphocyte-predominant breast cancer because you have more lymphocytes here than cancer cells. And here, those, those um, 
uh, bluish areas are cancer cells, cancer cell nests, I would call them, but surrounded, these are all lymphocytes, all these small um, black tumor uh, cells are, are lymphocytes. So they are there to trying to kill the cancer. However, cancers grow despite that, so there must be a reason for it. And I will tell you later about PD-1 and its pathway in, in a way that cancers shield the attack from those killer cells. But first, how do they, um, do they matter, these lymphocytes in the tumor? And, um, and I'm mainly going to talk about triple negative breast cancer, or TNBC. Um, that is one of the most aggressive subtypes of breast cancer, um, as you may know, because there is no uh, estrogen receptors or HER2 receptors that basically would offer you targeted options. So you are stuck with chemotherapy as the single modality for this um, cancer. They're more aggressive, they have higher recurrence rates, they afflict younger women. Um, so we definitely need better therapies for this group of patients. And uh, when you look at these different breast cancer subtypes in a very large gene set, you can see the basal-like or triple negative breast cancers here that have probably in about 20% of those tumors have lymphocytes um, in, in the tumor and it's the highest number compared to the other breast cancer subtypes. So here you have luminal A cancers which are mostly estrogen driven, uh, hormone receptor positive tumors and their lymphocytes don't matter actually, which is interesting because macrophages seem to matter more in that subtype. So it's really subtype specific. So looking at the uh, infiltration of triple negative breast cancers with lymphocytes. Um, here I show that they are highest and they are prognostic, which is really important. And I will show you that data set. This is work that we have done. Uh, one of the largest trials in this country uh, 10 years ago was giving women chemotherapy after surgery when they had triple negative breast cancer. And we went back and looked at those archived slides from the initial diagnosis and we counted the lymphocytes in the tumors. And you can actually see that each percent increase or 10% increase of lymphocytes in the tumor predicted a much better outcome for the, for the patient. And it was so dramatic that you can actually see here, it reduced the chance for death for that woman by 19%. So each 10% increase, some women had zero lymphocytes in their tumors, other had 60%. And you can see here in, in this um, uh, simplified schema, that women with lots of lymphocytes or lymphocyte predominant breast cancer had excellent survival, whereas women with no immune cells in their tumors had very poor outcomes. So this was the first evidence that actually in breast cancer, the immune system matters. And uh, this was basically from untreated patients who then after surgery got standard chemotherapy. No immune therapies, just standard chemotherapy and radiation. And they did better if you already had a pre-existing immune response um, to this cancer. So this was then also shown in many other studies. And um, in, um, in summary, we actually came up with guidelines how to score these lymphocytes in tumors so that they can be um, you know, evaluated in clinical trials or in, even in practice, even though it hasn't yet uh, fully uh, gone into uh, practice. But the other, the other thing that this is very exciting about is that if your immune system predicts outcome, we can probably twist some things to make outcomes better. So I talked about the, the word PD-1 and pd one and that is if you have lymphocytes in the tumor, they may actually have initially worked, but then they are calmed down, they are, they are no longer active and trying to kill cancer. And that is because they can upregulate certain receptors on their surface, molecules that actually slow them down. And that is uh, one of those receptors is called PD-1 or programmed death receptor. That receptor comes up if the lymphocyte sits in the cancer area um, and the cancer brings out these shields called pd one that induce PD-1 expression on the lymphocyte. So this is basically a very negative signal for, from the immune system to calm down the immune response against the cancer uh, because this cancer was very smart and outsmarted the current response. What you do is you take an antibody and you block that interaction and you can then re-stimulate those T cells or lymphocytes that are in the tumor microenvironment to really do their job and finish kill the tumor. 
So this is very, very exciting. And based on our initial discoveries that breast cancers are immunogenic, or at least in triple negative breast cancer they are, um, companies that had these compounds were interested in studying them in breast cancer. So the, these are some of the first uh, trials that were presented a couple of years ago now um, that gave us lots of hope for this field. Um, and these are women who have metastatic breast cancer where um, the tumors are located in, in lymph nodes, in uh, liver, in lung, in, in other organs. And they are with chemotherapy not curable. In fact, despite chemotherapy, the survival rate is about one year in the, for those patients. So in this treatment, um, in these treatment trials, what we saw is that the tumor volume, and this is like zero where you start out with the baseline volume of the tumor when you enter a clinical trial, um, was in many patients actually decreasing just with this hormone, uh, with this uh, immune therapy that blocked that shield between the T cell and the cancer cell. And most importantly, some of those responses were, were durable. They, they stayed um, in this um, response rate for a long time. Um, three years out now, we have patients that were receiving these drugs and they are still without any detectable cancer um, on scans. And that is exciting. Chemotherapy does not do that. And that really encourages us to continue to search for better treatments and combination therapies. Because in this trial, we only saw 18% of women respond. And in the subsequent trial, which I actually led, which was a global, global trial in uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer, uh, we saw that it only really helps a very small subset of patients. These were all women with advanced triple negative breast cancer that were not selected by pdl one status which is something we look at often in the tumors now. And these are the waterfall plots, meaning that if you go down, you have shrinkage of your tumor. If you go up, unfortunately, it is um, growth and progression. So only uh, very few women had complete shrinkage of their cancer um, and what we call usually partial response around 30%, um, some patients had. But the good news in this, um, in this study also is that once you had a response, even though small numbers of patients, they could be durable. Um, again, we could have women uh, three, four years on these drugs without any recurrent disease. But certainly the numbers are small, so we like to um, um, increase them and make them more applicable to other patients as well. So what we did actually is design trials that combine these immune therapies with chemotherapies, which are the main um, stay of therapy in triple negative breast cancer. And, um, and that allowed us a couple of things. Number one is it kept patients stable because as I mentioned before, these are very aggressive tumors um, that without therapy very quickly, women uh, become very ill. So chemotherapy, in addition to the immune therapy, allowed some stability. It also shrank tumors, which sometimes allowed um, less immune suppression that is uh, coming from the tumor. And we learned over the last decade or so that some chemotherapies can actually promote a healthy immune response. Very, um, very uh, counterintuitive to what we always think, that chemotherapy does kill your immune system. It's not completely true. Uh, depending on the doses, the scheduling, the sequencing of therapies, it can actually promote an immune response. So this is a, uh, a trial uh, which I'm very proud of because this was the first um, chemo and immunotherapy trial in this country that I led. And here you can see that the waterfall plot is incredibly much better than uh, just the immunotherapy alone trials that we had done before. And we also showed that uh, we look at the word response rate here, overall response rate, that patients who just had diagnosed, had been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer had the highest response of 54%. So nearly half the patients in that arm responded. Um, but when you go to later lines, if they already had chemotherapy in the metastatic setting, then response rates would drop um, more. But the other important thing is that while this trial was designed to initially combine chemotherapy and immunotherapy, uh, we only mandated a four cycle um, treatment of chemotherapy after which we dropped it often. So women got to um, enjoy a year or two years off chemotherapy. Um, and I mentioned to you before, life expectancy is usually one year with chemotherapy. So this was major 
um, um, enjoyment in the clinic by seeing women do well, hair growing back, etc. And excitingly for me is that um, survival curves that we've seen in many cancers now with immunotherapy, where there is a tail of 10, 20, 30% of patients that still are surviving years later, that we kind of saw this too. So this is now going out to two years, the data, um, and you can see there is a substantial number of patients um, alive, which is not what we see with chemotherapy alone. Um, so I am very happy about that. Of course, we're not where we want to be with having every single patient respond, but that's why we need much more research, such as what Mikala is doing here, to understand other factors that, that participate, not just lymphocytic um, infiltrate and how we can um, improve that response, but also what the other components in the microenvironment do. Um, so this is a very dear patient of mine who um, you know, had an incredible response and uh, always makes me smile when she comes. She is much younger than me in her 30s. Um, she's a physician and um, she came to us. She was referred for the clinical trial that we had at NYU at the time um, several years back for Memorial. And she, when she came to us, she had um, disease. This is, you know, a body PET CT and these are lymph node uh, metastases and these are lung, um, lung metastases. And, um, she had interesting findings on her scan because after the first two treatments on her scan, the lung uh, lesions all went away, but then she developed new lymph node lesions in her chest wall. And uh, when we see this on chemotherapy, we say we have to stop chemotherapy immediately, but in immunotherapy, where you can actually have an immune response, inflammation, and, and, and so on, you may see new tumors pop up that are not um, worrisome, and you actually continue therapy. So we luckily did for her, and after two more cycles, all of that disappeared. We were able to drop her chemotherapy, which is a taxane, which can cause over uh, many months neuropathy um, or you know, numbness of uh, fingertips, and she is a pediatric intensivist where she actually needs her fingertips to put IVs into babies. So uh, we dropped the chemotherapy, and she's been since uh, completely without any evidence of disease. And she doesn't even count on the, on the plot of, uh, of tumors that go down because of this new finding on the second scan. So officially she is a progressive disease patient, but she really had um, tremendous benefit from, from therapy. Um, and, and so this trial that I explained to you, which was the first chemotherapy immunotherapy trial, gave rise to the largest um, trial uh, done in this country now, which is hopefully going to get results either this year or next year, that um, is a trial looking at survival outcomes in women that um, have newly diagnosed metastatic disease that is triple negative. And uh, that trial has completed enrollment um, in, um, in the world actually, was mostly done uh, outside the US. Uh, these are some examples of combination therapies that are now not just in a metastatic setting, but also in earlier breast cancer settings. So the, the one you may have heard about last year was called the iSPY2 trial, where immunotherapy was added to chemotherapy before surgery. And you read out at the surgery time how many cancers disappeared at that time. And it was three times the, um, the rate when you added immune therapy to it. So these are um, quite remarkable uh, data, and I think it really um, invigorated uh, not just the T-cells, but also our field in, um, in truly believing that, that this uh, will work, um, hopefully for many more patients. So, um, And you may have also heard on NPR and the news lately, so that's why I'm adding this um, case report from the National Cancer Institute uh, of a woman treated not with triple negative breast cancer, which is probably the most responsive to immune therapies, but hormone positive breast cancer who had uh, metastatic disease, and uh, the group there did a very sophisticated laboratory um, analysis. They took a patient's a piece of the tumor, she had multiple metastases, but she, they took one piece, they isolated these lymphocytes, um, these T cells from the patient's tumor, and figured out which ones uh, recognized new uh, mutations on the tumors, and then enriched the product before giving it back to the patient in billions of cells. Um, so basically they, um, they picked out the good killer cells, 
they um, enrich them and then infuse them back into the patient with a complete clinical response. And that was the, um, the picture. This is a, a CT scan, so you have the sagittal view where, um, sorry, the coronal view where you have, uh, these are the reconstructed breasts here, but there's a large soft tissue mass close to the heart here that is gone after therapy. And this is the, the liver here with multiple metastases in the liver. They're all gone with the therapy. But to say um, that this was just this reinfusion of lymphocytes is, is incorrect because the patient got lots of other therapy. So she got before the uh, infusion of TILs, we call them tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. She also got chemotherapy to kind of um, kill down many other immune cells she had. And then she got this boost of um, tumor reactive lymphocytes followed by PD-1 drugs, uh, which I mentioned to you before. So this was a, um, you know, a celebrated uh, victory because it has shown hormone positive breast cancer patients can respond um, similar to other cancers. And um, you know, just because I had to promote my own work, um, I wanted to show that we published actually years ago a patient who had a fantastic response to immunotherapy. Um, and um, I apologize if, if um, for the pictures, but this was really a uh, very impressive uh, breast cancer. This was a woman who um, came in uh, with already widely metastatic disease. She had calcium that was uh, leaching out of bones because of bone involvement. Um, she had destruction of, um, of bones in the uh, sternum, uh, involvement of the lung, et cetera. And we gave her chemotherapy with um, Avastin, which was approved at the time. And then um, later on added Imiquimod, which is a um, topical immune stimulant um, to her breast. Uh, which is kind of supposed to jumpstart the immune response against the tumor that is still in the patient. Um, and later on, she got hormone therapy, and she really cleared everything. There was no more cancer left on any scans, and many years later, she was um, cancer-free. And we were able to actually go back, um, draw blood from her later, two years later, and then compare it. And we showed that just a simple application of uh, topical immunostimulators onto the tumor could initiate an immune response against cancer that then was just amplified through regular standard therapies. So I wanted to leave you with um, some uh, concluding thoughts on here, um, and that is that the immune response is crucial um, in, in the outcome for patients. And um, in the first part of the talk, you heard that neutrophils, uh, and also from my talk, that uh, macrophages can actually facilitate spread of cancer into other organs and therefore uh, usually give you a poor prognosis. But on the other hand, you also have lymphocytes or CD8 or killer cells that can kill tumors and have a much better outcome for patients. Um, talking about immunotherapies in breast cancer, uh, what is most exciting are these durable responses that we see. Uh, in a subset of patients with these drugs that target PD-1 and PD-L1. Um, however, responses are still low, um, probably in the 5% range or 10% range, but um, they should be much higher. So combination therapy is likely where we have to go next, and that could be multi-immune therapies or radiation with uh, immunotherapy. But, um, you know, we have... Um, uh, pioneered the chemotherapy combination, and I think that is a very important um, partner uh, to, to ther for therapies. And then um, I think we still need to, to do much more in understanding the biology of, of uh, the microenvironment of the cancer and the responses of the, of the patient um, to, um, to really cure more patients. But um, Anyway, I wanted to leave you with this, and um, the thank you slide didn't make it onto the talk. I'm uh, very sorry for that, uh, but Mikala's talk reminded me. So um, I'm very grateful to patients uh, who participate in our uh, clinical trials, uh, the research team that is incredible in, in um, keeping things um, in order, the referring physicians. Um, you know, I have to tell you, in New York City, I'm very proud of uh, colleagues in all centers. Uh, we, when we, for instance, have a young woman who has metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we call each other and ask, do you have a clinical trial to participate in? Because we know chemotherapy is not the choice, so we do um, send each other patients for, for certain trials, and that is very, very helpful. Um, and I'm also very grateful to my own uh, team of um, seven oncologists uh, who you know, only see breast cancer patients, our radiation docs, our 
surgeons, pathologists, uh, and so on. And then, of course, the funding agencies such as the NCI, the Department of Health, um, and many other um, good groups to support this work because um, it's you know, not only pharma that um, should make uh, progress. And, um, and lastly, collaborators such as uh, Mikala um, and then Nina Bardwash at, at um, Sinai who are really close friends and um, good colleagues. So thank you. We have time for a couple of questions first for Dr. Adams, and then we'll do a general Q&A with both Dr. Adams and Dr. Agablad. Um, chemotherapy drugs, are they similar or completely different, and how do you decide what drug is used for what patient? That is a very good question. Um, so for um, curative intent therapy, meaning early on in breast cancer, we use very standard regimens that have been designed through very large clinical trials, like the one that I presented, where you have multi-drug regimens. Um, but for later stages, um, we usually use single agents, um, and we still don't fully understand their impact on the immune system. And I think we are currently uh, working on that. So we are having several protocols open that we ask for tumor tissue from patients on therapies, on standard therapies, because we really want to understand how chemotherapy, for instance, um, impacts neutrophils, macrophages, and so on. So in the curative setting, yes, it's all, um, it's all cookbook um, from established trials, but in later lines, um, it, it's still a lot of unknown because uh, they're not great. So, so most of the drugs were actually um, discovered many years ago, decades ago. Uh, they have a mechanism of action such as just um, adhering to enzymes in, in, in cells that inhibit the repair of these cancer cells when they have um, um, any insult to them. Some others have just uh, blocking uh, reproduction of cancer cells by, by adding uh, particles to their DNA. So it's really toxins that, um, that are... Um, you know, used for treating cancers. But there are different drugs for different cancers, too. So we don't use, for instance, drugs that are used in lung cancer or vice versa. If someone was being diagnosed as metastatic tomorrow, what would you advise them to do? I think that's, um, you know, pretty simple, even though it's not a simple thing at all. but. Um, it, it is to really search um, for doctors um, and trials because um, we are not yet there in terms of curing metastatic breast cancer. So I think I would look um, very aggressively at clinical trials, and that's what the NCI designated cancer centers do. The mandate is to really um, have good trials available. And I think if you find the right oncologist, they will help you in, in this. I. Um I was very impressed with the, uh, those last uh, pictures where you showed the uh, breast uh, change dramatically over a relatively short period of time. Uh, that was a, a, a topical application of, of a chemical, right? So the topical was actually um, given only for eight weeks um, at, a, at a time later on when the cancer had already somewhat stabilized. Initially, it was chemotherapy. And then the topical later when she had stabilized disease, and then later on it was just hormone therapy. Well, the the reason why I, I couch the question is the the real question is chemo surgery and uh, and uh, uh, radiation seem to have very big downsides, and and they might actually progress the cancer more. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I have the experience of losing my first, first wife and, uh, to cancer. And uh, the chemo, I think, just aggravated the whole situation. Now, I, I think it's the technology that has proved itself not to be very good. Are you on that uh, same page? So I think chemo um, can sometimes be detrimental, and that's when patients are weaker and the cancer has widely progressed, and that is important to discuss what are the benefits of treatment versus the risks. But in early breast cancer, 
meaning that it's still confined to the breast and lymph nodes locally. Um, it is a definitely a changer in the cure rates. It, it does help us cure patients, lots of them. So I truly believe still in that um, triple approach of radiation surgery and chemotherapy, although there are now trials ongoing, can we actually skip surgery because our chemotherapies are pretty good and we can probably skip surgery in some patients and, and those are trials that need to be performed before we can say we can do that. I don't know how to answer that question. What's my success with surgery in, in early breast cancer? No, I, it was in, in this particular case, it was bladder cancer. And it had broken through the wall of the bladder. Right. And uh, it was, uh, and they removed the bladder. And uh, I think, you know, not that having the science of uh, background like you do, that you're disrupting the body in such a dramatic way that you might actually. Mm -hmm. So, so I think Mikala brought that up, right? That if you do a lot of abdominal surgery, um, and yes, you can stimulate wound healing processes that can actually facilitate metastases. Yes, that is um, still a possibility on the table. And um, interestingly, for instance, if you take antibiotics during immune uh, therapies, you can uh, weaken that response to immune therapy. So it, it's because the gut bacteria that are being killed by antibiotics for the flu or for, for any kind of infection, um, or antivirals um, can actually make your own immune system less susceptible to, to these therapies. So yes, much more to understand. I think for muscle invasive bladder cancer, um, the standard is first chemotherapy. And now we are curing lots of those patients actually with uh, immune therapy too. Bladder cancer is one of the best um, tumors to respond to. So, yes, but now it's, um, it's prime time for bladder cancer actually. I'd like to invite both of our speakers up to the chairs up here, we'll do a general Q&A for both of them. So then you can move that back. And can you guys pass back and forth? Get up for a second. <laughs> Thank you. Is there research that is presently going on to discover how and why the body makes these different types of immune cells and to encourage the body to make the immune cells that would be helpful to kill cancer cells? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that, that's, uh, there are many of us that are studying um, what are the normal stimuli that are inducing the different types of immune cells and how to boost them. So that's a very active field of research. Are similar uh, response rates being seen with each of the PD-1, PD-L1 uh, blockers run the development now to, to what you were talking about, the relatively modest uh, results? Yeah, I think they are, they are very similar you know, across the, uh, the board. Um, slightly, um, um, actually, the, the side effect profiles are also very similar. So, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so, which of the treatments is better for beating the cancer? Um, the immune, the net, or the hormonal, like which is better, do they all have faults? I think you saw in Sylvia's trial design that it's all about combinations. I think um, when we are targeting the nets, even in, in uh, mice, we get some good response in some of the mice, but not in all of them, and it's telling us that we need to combine uh, to do multiple approaches, but that's, that's my take. And you know, to encourage that research, um, it takes women to participate in trials where we actually obtain blood and tissue from, from patients. And I'm really grateful to women in our um, combination trials with chemotherapy and immune therapy. They are willing to give us um, serial biopsies of tumors um, to um, really study the changes of each of the components of therapy. And also, I think to go into trials that are basket trials where you have 
um, you know, more suitable therapies for patients with certain um, questions is important. Um, I think endocrine therapy is still wonderful for hormone receptor. Sorry? It, it, it depends. So most of the combination trials now that are being designed are looking at biomarkers in the tumor. You know, do you have this protein that is expressed? And then you can enter a trial that um, has, has certain drugs targeting that. Um, so I think in the future we'll see more of those directed uh, patient-specific arms of trials. And maybe I can add to, to the NETs. It's not all, uh, all types of breast cancer or cancer that we are seeing the NETs in. Uh, it may not be all patients that have infection, all types of infections that cause these NETs. And so that's why we're focusing on developing assays so we can see whether or not there are any NETs. So it's, it's combinations and finding whether or not this particular target is present in the individual patient. Hi, my name is Kevin, and um, my question is, in recent literature, a high-fat diet has been shown to affect gut microbiome and promote angiogenesis and tumorigenesis in an array of cancers from breast to prostate to can uh, prostate cancer to colon. Uh, and with the trials of cancer, the last thing you want to do is go on diet. But do you think that reducing the fat intake in cancer patients could reduce angiogenesis and then inhibit immune cell access to tumor cells and thereby significantly reduce the impact of TEMs on the eff effectivity of chemotherapeutic agents? So I think that the um, high-fat diet is, is doing things both to, um, to the gut bacteria as well as to different immune cells. Um, so it's, it's a pretty complex question at this point, what, what is going on on the different immune cells. Um, but there is strong evidence that things are going on, including on the neutrophils. So this is a very active research area. And I actually want to mention also um, that trials are now being designed that look at um, fecal transfers. Um, so stool of some patients who have great responses to these therapies given to patients who didn't have responses to therapies, who may then actually develop responses. That's been shown in mouse models to work really well. And we use it also for um, infections uh, often in the colon, but that is the next wave you know, to really modulate, uh, to hit additional targets when we give these therapies. Hi, uh, so in the case of macrophages and neutrophils, are the cancer cells actually utilizing the immune cells uh, processes that are already going on in order to perform these, or are they actually signaling to the immune cells to perform the process for them? I, I think it's a bit of both, but uh, we are starting to know a lot about the signals that the cancer cells are using. So in, in the case of uh, our work, we've seen cancer cells send out the same kind of signals that would be sent out if there was an infection to attract the macrophages and the neutrophils. But they're also sending out signals to, to flip the switches on these cells. Both macrophages and neutrophils actually can be killer cells, uh, but the, the tumor cells send out the signals so that they are not. Um, We'd be starting to know a lot about these signals and trying to target them and, and do that in combination with the, um, with the drugs that activate T cells. somewhat like a permanent remission. I think that we've seen that that is possible. It, I mean, it's not possible in all patients, but we know that it's possible. And so now that the next wave is to find out how do we make that happen for, for everyone or for the majority. And I think the discoveries in the last couple of years for hormone positive breast cancers have been quite practice changing. So. Uh, there are new drugs, and you probably see those on TV all the time. They're targeting certain um, uh, points in the cell cycle, and they're called CDK inhibitors. And you probably saw Ibrands and, and all these other uh, drugs on, on TV. And when we add those to regular endocrine or hormone therapies for patients who have metastatic breast cancer, they, um, they have no cancer worsening for up to three years. 
in their first treatment line, and we used to um, know that the hormone therapy alone probably kept them well for one year, and then we had to switch to the second um, regimen. But now we can add it to the first one, and it's from one to three years. Same with targeted therapies for metastatic breast cancer. The addition of uh, pertuzumab added um, life expectancy from four to five years now in HER2 uh, breast cancer in metastatic. So I think we are making actually lots of progress. I hope that the immune therapy will, uh, will be part of it, especially for triple negative breast cancer because we haven't made any progress there over the last few decades. And that's where we really need, um, need a booster. But I think for most um, patients that's true. Um, they are chronic illnesses. Hi, good evening. Um, actually, I have two questions. I'll throw them out there quick and see if, what happens. Um, what work, if any, have you been doing in the area of controlling inflammation or curing that? Um, and I know mo most of this is directed to breast cancer, which I'm personally thankful to you for. But for prostate cancer, is there any relevance of immunotherapy uh, after a prostatectomy with a rising PSA? <laughs> so prostate cancer is not completely my field, but um, you know, in prostate cancer, it's lagged behind even worse than in breast cancer. But um, there are at least there is there is a vaccine approved in, in um, prostate cancer. It's called uh, Provenge, that extends survival for patients who have uh, metastatic disease. I think for the rising PSA question, that is still um, it's an unanswered question, but there are many new targets that are being tested in clinical trials. So again, I would encourage anyone you know to participate in trials. You know, I work very closely with my prostate um, colleague at NYU who is bringing in very interesting trials that, that may target certain um, checkpoint molecules. Um, yes, give me a second. I will, <laughs> I will give you the David Wise, like the wise old man. He's very young. Um, and inflammation, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a very hard one because inflammation is part of um, our living and you can't remove all inflammation. It's helpful, wound healing and many other things. Um, so there were many trials looking at COX inhibitors or aspirin to, to you know, try to inhibit it. But um, I, I haven't seen much success in this field yet. I, I think that goes back to trying to understand what, what is really happening, right? Because inflammation has a lot of, of uh, benefits to us. It, we need it. So if we can find out which part of it it is that the tumor is hijacking, then uh, that may be a way to design new trials that can better target that. But it is true right now there's we are lacking the real targets. What is it in inflammation that's bad? And we think that the NEDS is part of that equation. This, uh, this not be your specialty, but I've been asking this question for quite a while when I've come here. Chirogenics on a tumor. Now we know how frostbite works. It just destroys the skin or whatever. And there's no ill effects from it. it the, the, what has been frozen, the cells just, the body just absorbs them with no parallel bleeding or other things. And I'm, I still don't know why it's not a trial when a tumor is obvious in the breast or any place else. They don't go in with a small tube or whatever and just freeze it in the areas around it. You have any thoughts on that? So it's not an approved kind of method for breast cancer treatment because the downside to cryotherapy, uh, freezing the tumor, is that you never get to see the tissue. You never get to evaluate if the margins are clear, um, which is what we rely on often in recommending radiation and so on. But there are trials um, with combining actually cryotherapy with immunotherapy in breast cancer before their standard surgery. That, that trial has been done at Memorial. Um, and it's been published, and actually the cryotherapy uh, can induce an immune response to the cancer as well. So, but it's not yet mainstream. I think it, it will be, you know, pursued in clinical research, but um, it has certainly some benefits to it. Here we go. 
Is this approach, is this approach uh, applicable to other cancers such as brain cancer, which is, I guess, completely different type of cancer as compared to breast cancer? You mean clinical uh, research with uh, the checkpoint drugs or immune therapy drugs? Uh, yeah, immune therapy yeah. with um, brain cancer, GBM in particular. Yeah, I think it's still lagging behind um, in that field, but there are vaccine studies in, in GBMs that uh, are somewhat promising. Um, also great colleague at NYU, Andrew Chi is the head of <laughs> that. I would ask for trials. Hi, so I was wondering about dormant cancer cells. Do they have certain processes that allow them to stay alive for long periods of time and not uh, potentially go through uh, apoptosis? I think that that's a great question. So, so there is um, a lot of active research in that field at the moment. Uh, there's some data suggesting that something called autophagy, um, a process where the cell is, is partly eating itself to sustain it might be involved, but it's, it's not clear yet. Um, I think the autophagy is going to look promising in the end. Uh, it's just a question about uh, the process that you work through, and that is um, there's much discussion about you know, wor working from your research with mice and then uh, to clinical trials with uh, people. And, and then, then the process through the FDA to get uh, approve, approval for treatment, much discussion about what take, does it take too long? Do, uh, should things be speeded up? Should approvals be click? In your work, do you find the system in any way a difficulty or that it works just great? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I think some of this is, has to take time. So I think that the basic research must take the time where we, we really get the experiments right. Uh, otherwise, sometimes you, you design the clinical trials wrong. And so there's an example in my field where there were a group of, um, of drugs called matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors, and they were... Um, studied in mice, but they were pushed to clinical trial, and, and while the trials then came out showing negative results, the mouse experiments essentially showed that they were giving to the wrong kind of patients. Um, so I think that was an example of, of being pushed too fast. And then, of course, there's other examples where things go very slowly. I think that is often the case if you don't have the right collaborators, if you don't know what to do with your, with your research in mice, well, how do you take it to the next step? That has been, I think, challenging before, but I think that there's more and more of these collaborations that we are having now where clinicians and, um, and basic scientists are talking already as the research is developing and thinking about how can we take it to, to the clinic as fast as possible. There's many frustrations uh, running trials. The regulatory system is very um, rigid and uh, requires many steps. However, it does take time, as Mikala said, because you have to wait for survival data often, uh, not to be blinded by early responses in small trials. So you do have to really do um, the due diligence to, to make sure what gets really FDA approved is worth it. Um, but I also I think that um, in this country, clinical research is not yet as um, favorably viewed uh, because in children's cancers, for instance, when you look at the children oncology group, which is the cooperative group uh, in this country, they enroll about 90% of all the children in clinical trials, 90%, and in adults we have uh, maybe 3% of patients who go into trials. So uh, we're, it takes time to make progress, unfortunately, and it would be so much more um, helpful and um, faster if, if the majority of patients uh, join trials. But now there are certainly um, other efforts at, um, at mining data from standard practice use of drugs to see if across the United States, for those patients who don't enter trials, if the current therapy serve them well or not, and finding outliers and especially good responders and see what, what they have received. So hopefully that will be the next wave with very um, intelligent systems to extract medical data 
to help us guide in the clinic a bit more what which patient should get what chemotherapy because right now it's based on just the risks benefits um, discussion with each woman. Please, please join me in thanking Dr. Egelblad and Dr. Adams. There is a coffee reception right outside in the lobby. Please enjoy. They'll be here too to continue to the discussion. Thank you.